Okay, hello everyone, and welcome back to the BMW Blog Podcast. Um, today we have a very special guest, Tom Malogny, and uh, he actually has a YouTube channel, State of Charge. And we have uh, him on here today because he is sort of an electric pioneer, right? You, you were the first uh, elect- a pure electric BMW owner. Uh, is it North America or the world, actually? Yeah, I have the great distinction of being the very first customer worldwide to take either possession of a purchase or a lease of an all-electric BMW. That was back in 2012 when I was the first customer to take uh, the BMW Active E, which was a one series that was converted to fully electric drive. I was the first person to take possession of that vehicle. That's awesome. So, so you really were there at the actual very beginning of BMW's entire like electric, you know, kind of journey there. Um, so, what was that like to kind of be that sort of pioneer, so to speak, that uh, you know, the very first one? Right. So if you really want to go back to the beginning, we have to go a little bit further than the Active E. Uh, Two years before that, in 2009, a BMW launched this pilot program that they had made about 600 all-electric Mini Coopers. Uh, And they these were for uh, just pure research. Um, they they used all third party parts. There were there wasn't BMW motors or electronics in them. They basically bought all these parts off the shelf and put it together um, because they they knew that they had to start to learn about electrification. So they figured right. a good way to start would be listen. Let, let's get some of these out there in the hands of people, and we'll learn about the difficulty of charging. We'll learn about customer behavior, uh, what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. So I was in that program. That started in 2009, uh, and I drove that Mini Cooper uh, for about two and a half years until they launched their second pilot program, and that was with the one okay. series converted so what, uh, called the Active How different was e. it to drive those two? Was the Mini, like, did it feel like it was made from third-party parts, or was it? did it feel like a cohesive kind of product? Well, it it was it was awesome fun to drive. I mean, it was my first electric car. It had that instant torque. It had the Mini Cooper kind of go kart handling. So it was a blast. But that said, yeah, you could tell that it wasn't a polished production vehicle. Uh, they broke down frequently. You know, if you had a Mini E, you 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 definitely had a good relationship with the local tow truck driver. Um, but you know, that was part of being a beta test. You know, it was it was almost part of the fun, you know. Uh, and I mean, this was the think think this was back in two thousand nine. There was no, there really were no other electric vehicles on the road. Tesla had just started putting out their Roadster, which they only made a couple thousand of those, and they were like one hundred and ten thousand dollars. And you know, at that point, everybody was like, you know, Tesla, who are they? They're, this company's never going to make it, you know. And um, so I was one of the few people driving around in all electric car, so it was totally cool. But yeah, you could tell it wasn't a polished production vehicle. Right. Now, how did the Active E feel in contrast to that? Did that feel more polished? Yeah, so that was that was a big step forward because the Active E now was all designed and engineered by BMW. And they took their one series uh, and converted it, you know, pulled out all the, well, actually never put them in, but converted the, um, put the batteries in the transmission tunnel. So they were running down the center of the vehicle. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, had the electric motor that was integrated uh, into the rear uh, axle. It was rear-wheel drive, you know, blast the drive. Um, and it had a lot of things that the Mini E didn't have. Like it had thermal management system, which would heat and cool the batteries. Uh, it just, you know, it was it was that next step. It actually was a lot of the parts in the Active E ended up in the i3. It was kind of like a, um, a beta test for the i3's powertrain. Uh, you know, so the, all the, the, the motor, the, the, um, all the electronics and components were the components that they were eventually going to use in the i3. Okay, so, so they actually kind of almost did two beta tests, right? So they had the Mini they and did. The, the Active E, and they really kind of did their homework before the i3 came out. Right. And now you also own an i3. So, yeah, so then when the i3 came out in 2014, I got the first uh, i3 with range extender in the U.S., uh, and, um, yeah, that was cool. So I had a couple of firsts with BMW's electrics. Um, that was a 2014 and I kept that for about two and a half years, about three years. And unfortunately it got totaled. I was driving through an intersection and someone ran a red light 
and just T-boned me on the side and uh, totaled it. I mean, I, I was perfectly fine, um, but the, the carbon fiber frame was cracked. And once that happens, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough uh, fix. But I tell you, it performed exceptionally in the crash. It really, for a little car like that to get, you know, T-boned right in the door, car was going like 45, 50 miles an hour. They didn't even slow down. They just ran a red light and hit me. Uh, the car performed excellent. I wasn't injured. I wasn't, you know, every, everything was fine. But, you know, the car was dead. Uh, so then, now that's, um, that was like in the middle of 2017. Uh, I waited a couple of months because BMW was coming out with the i3S. They already announced it at that point. So, but the i3S wasn't coming until uh, like, uh, it was supposed to come in early uh, 2019. Uh, or no, early 2018. And the funny thing is, I was at the Frankfurt Auto Show that year uh, with BMW. I actually made a, uh, a TED Talk with BMW uh, at the Frankfurt Auto Show. It was really cool on the future of mobility. Uh, and while I was there, I was talking to a couple of the BMW program managers, and they all knew me from the Mini E program and the i3 program, I mean the Active E program. And they said, Tom, we heard you had an accident. You don't have a, a, an i3 anymore. What, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I like the i3S, but, you know, I... I you know, it's, I don't know when it's, I can't wait till like January or February. This was in September during the, uh, um, you know, during, during the Frankfurt Auto Show. And uh, funny thing is, they said, no, we, you have to be in an i3. It's not right. I said, well, I really like the i3S, but I, I can't wait that long. Make a long story short, they arranged to get me one like a month before they shipped them to everybody else. <laughs> and and, and I, got, I, I got one in December of 2000. Uh, eight, uh, 17. I was the only customer delivery of that in December and they started coming in January. Yeah. And then BMW in North America arranged for me to get an i3 as a long-term media loan for a month or two in between. So I, so that's, so I was in a car, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. So wow, they took care cool. of me well. Well, you were clearly a premier customer. I mean, <laughs> you're beta testing half their electric cars so, or all of them actually. So yeah, you, uh, you definitely deserve that. And so you really saw the very beginning of BMW's entire electric kind of journey. I mean, you, you went from the beta test to the, to the i3. And yeah. um, now the i3 is, you know, it's on its last leg. So what do you, how do you kind of feel about the totality of that? Like, did, did, was the i program a success? Uh, was there some more that BMW should have done, could have done? Uh, how do you feel about that? Sure. So I, I do say it was a success. And uh, obviously, I mean, you could always do more. Um, there's a, a few things right. that I had wished BMW had done. Um, you know, number one, I wish right from the beginning, they should have had a sport version like the i3s. Um, uh, there's no reason right. for them not to, you know, come on, it's BMW, you know, it's performance. Right. Right. And it gave the car such a different feel. When I got that i3s, I was like, wow, like, this is what this car should have been all along with the wider stance, the lower suspension, right. the sport tune suspension, the extra power. It was like, it felt like a different car. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so that's one of the things that I really wish they had done right from the beginning. Um, and, you know, they also could have um, been a little more aggressive with the battery cells. Uh, the BMW is a conservative company and, you know, that, that, that pays dividends for them in some ways. Um, but they also, they went with very conservative cells so that they didn't have very high energy density. And when that happens, you don't have as good a range. You know, when the right. i3 first came out in 2014, the, the all-electric version only had 81 miles of range. So, right. I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're stuck. You're on a 35-mile leash from your house, you know, because right. you've you got to be able to get back. Right. So, you know, they could have been more aggressive with those cells and it should have launched from day one with over 100 miles of range. The technology was there. The batteries were available. Um, that's what I, I wish they had done. But, you know, other than that, I, I thought it was a great car. It was expensive for what it was, but it was cutting edge technology. You know, right. what I, name the, the other carbon fiber and aluminum car you can buy, you know, with thermal yeah. plastics on the outside and all recycled materials on the interior i mean it, right. it's a cool car i know it looks funky i know a lot of bmw you know enthusiasts looked at it and said gosh that's not a bmw <laughs> but it also is a cool vehicle it's it, you know right. the people that had them loved them i know so many people 
that had multiple I3s like I did. That, I know somebody that ha- that's had four of them. <laughs> Our own Horatio. He's, he's had, yeah. I think he said three. Yeah, right? I think Chuck Vossler also, right? How, yeah. how, how yeah, many has he had? Several. You know, yeah, and these are these are hardcore BMW enthusiasts. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I, I didn't never owned one, but I've driven it several times, and I've always really liked it. Actually, I just thought it drove great. Um, it was really fun, very small, short wheelbase, rear wheel drive. You know, very nippy, low center of gravity. But I also yeah. really, uh, I thought it had one of the best interiors BMW's ever done. I agree, a hundred percent. It's not a, I mean, it's not a great look, looking car traditionally, but I always thought it was kind of cool in this funky, strange sort of like oddball way like it's kind of like a little pug dog you know it's mm-hmm. funky looking but you still like it it's 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 i don't know i always kind of appreciated the i3 so um clearly the people that own them it's it stuck you know you've had several horatio had several chuck has had several so like it, it's a car that sticks clearly you know now, i i agree so many people that i know had multiple i3s more right. than any other car that i know like that, when people got one, they got another, the same car. Um, you know, so it, it, that tells you that, you know, I think when you had it, you got to appreciate it more than looking at it at a distance and saying, wow, that's kind of got real strange lines. You know what I mean? Right. When you when you owned it, I tell you, we don't have ours anymore. My lease, my lease on the i3S was up and, and that went back last year. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, I have a Tesla Model 3 now. Um, my wife still misses the i3. She much <laughs> preferred driving the i3 to the Tesla. Uh, really? So just, yeah, the, the outward view, you sit up high, you have a great view around you. Um, that is true. Yeah. Driving around, like you mentioned, it's, 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 a, it's a great car to drive in traffic. You know, she, yeah, she works is. in New York City. She usually takes public transportation, but every now and then she'll drive in there. And the car was so perfect for the city. And I mean, well, BMW called it the mega city car. So, right. you know, I mean, it, it was... You know that they supposedly designed it for cities. Uh, the the problem with that is you can't tell people where to drive cars. You know, I mean? right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when's when's the last time, you know, you or one of your friends said, "Hey, Nico, I'm going to go out and buy a city car." <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's tough when you kind of pigeonhole the car from the beginning, right? It, it is kind of tough. Uh, it kind of makes it a tough sell. But I think the i3 is um, is. It's a cool car that I think had did have its flaws, of course, like you mentioned, like range and, and things like that. But it's a car that a lot of fans, I mean, myself, we're, I'm going to miss it that it's gone, you know, that they're not going to make it anymore because it is, it is unique. And um, one of the interesting facts that most people don't realize, um, up until last year when COVID hit, every year the i3 was in production, 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, every year they sold more than they sold the previous year. They yeah, just kept selling right, more yeah. every single year. Now, I don't have the stats for 2020, um, but everything was down with 2020, you know, with, with, with COVID. Right. But, but, but I mean, that, that's a testament. Now, that, those stats don't hold true in the U.S. The numbers definitely receded in the U.S., but, they, but they, 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 they kept increasing in Europe, and that's why the numbers just kept going up every year. It's, it's, it's a better design for Europe, I think, than it was for North America. Yeah, probably. I would say so. Um, I mean, the proof is in the sales figures, as you said. Um, now, you said you own a Model 3 now. Um, the, the constant debate with every uh, legacy automaker versus Tesla is, you know, Tesla seems to have the range thing down, right? Like, they have more range than, than anyone else, uh, at least so far. Mercedes and, and uh, Audi are starting to catch up, but... Um, what what do you think the main differences are between owning a Tesla and something like an i3? Are there are there major advantages to owning a Tesla, um, or is it really just personal preference? So the the biggest advantage, well, you, you mentioned the the range, and the interesting thing is, you would think, well, they must just put in these giant batteries to go that much further, and it's not true. That there, one of the things that Tesla does really well is efficiency. Their powertrain right. efficiency is amazing. Um, I mean, you know, my, my car's EPA range, range rated at 353 miles, you know, and uh, it does that with a 78 kilowatt hour battery. You know, the, the oh, I-4, for small? instance. I didn't realize that. Yeah, the, the I-4, for instance, is coming out, um, you know, pretty soon. It's, it's about, it's, the dimensions are almost exactly the same as the Model 3, except it's three inches longer. The height and the width are the same, but it's three inches longer. 
and that has an 81 kilowatt hour battery. Let's wait and see what that gets EPA range rated at. It's not range rated yet, so it's all just estimates, but it's going to be dramatically less. And, and that's not even a knock against BMW. It's just to show that that's one of the things that Tesla is doing incredibly well. They get the most out of the battery pack on all of their models. Um, but if you really want to talk about what's the biggest advantage of owning a Tesla, it's their supercharger network. Right. It's yeah. ridiculous. They're everywhere. We, we went up to Maine from, I live in New Jersey, and we went up Same. to Maine on a, on a vacation uh, last month. And it's, it was about uh, almost 400 miles uh, away. And the funny thing is, I didn't even check to see where chargers were. We got in the car and I just headed to Maine on, with any other electric vehicle from any other company. I would have to pull out my app and said, okay, right. this charger is 200 miles away. Here's one. Maybe I could charge at this one. The th thing with Tesla, the superchargers are everywhere. You just get in your car and drive. You don't even think about it. They're like gas stations. So that's probably the biggest advantage, to be honest with you. And the, the process of this, using a supercharger is far more streamlined than, let's say, Electrify America or any of those uh, different stations, which I hear, I haven't used them. You actually used Electrify America once on a press trip with Audi. So like that mm -hmm. one doesn't really count because they had it all set up. But I hear they could be quite frustrating. Whereas yeah. uh, superchargers, it's very streamlined. It's very easy. Uh, it, makes, it makes charging much simpler. From yeah. what I Nico, you pull up, you just get out of your car and you plug in and that's it. You walk away. You don't even have to think about it. Yeah. Um, with all of the other manufacturers. Now, don't forget, you mentioned Electrify America. Electrify America is just one network. Yeah, they're the biggest network. But then there's Green Lots, there's ChargePoint, there's EVGo, there's SemiConnect, there's Flow, all these other networks that are out there. So you need to ha be members of all of these networks, you know, yeah. to, to, to be able to really have access to all the chargers. Uh, with Tesla, you don't have to worry about any of that. You, you don't have to join anywhere. You, you, you just need to own a yeah. Tesla and you can plug into their charger. So, um, and, and all the pricing is consistent. When you go to, when you go to charge point on a charge point charger, you might pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour and you go to one down the block and it's 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Really? Yeah. Uh, with Tesla, everything's the same. Now, Electrify America has standardized pricing and so does uh, EVGo. But ChargePoint, for instance, there's no standardized pricing. So you need to pull out your app. You need to say, okay, um, this one here costs this much. I'm not going to go to that one. That's way more. Um, so it, it, it's, it's complicated is what yeah. I'm getting at. And, and BMW customers have to live with that. And so do Audi customers and Mercedes customers because right. there is no standard network for everybody to just use. Now, the one thing I will mention, though, that's making charging easier is a technology called plug-in charge. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's just getting introduced now. Actually, the, the Porsche Taycan and the Mustang Mach-E are the only two cars that are um, plug-in charge capable. So this is a technology that's built into the cars now. And I, I'm pretty sure, although I don't have confirmation, I have to ask BMW if the i4 and iX are going to launch with plug-in charge. Um, but that basically means, like a Tesla station, you just pull up, you get out, and you plug your car in, and you walk away. And the car is going to communicate with the station. It's going to identify your vehicle, and then your account that you'll have set up previously will be billed for your charging. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. The car sorts out the, the whole yeah. stuff. Okay, that makes sense. I would imagine that Audi might come up with the technology as well, being the e-tron GT and the Taycan our shared platforms and, and all of that. But that's still a, a very slim number of cars at the moment. Yeah. And uh, Audi and Volkswagen are coming out with it really soon. Both both of those brands. Right. The, the ID4 for Volkswagen is going to have it in a couple of months from what I understand. Okay. Yeah, and I can imagine where that can get frustrating because the whole thing, like, we're not used to adapting our lives to our car, right? You know, uh, the current gasoline uh infrastructure has existed for a hundred years so we don't we it's already adapted to our lives whereas with you know having to fiddle with all those different accounts like we're, you have to drastically adapt how you drive to the car which can be frustrating i can understand why customers kind of shy away from that uh at the moment but and that's the one Tesla thing i'll shines. add to that though is uh, sorry to interrupt you no, no, no. is is that um with with electric vehicle charging 
most of the charging happens at home. Um, right, so, so you know, it, it, as far as adapting, you really have to do that when you're going on long road trips. Uh, more so uh, for me, for instance, I don't. I'll use public charging DC fast chargers maybe once a month, um, and and the rest of the time I'm just charging at home. You know, right. so you, y- yes, you do have to learn to adapt them. That, that still is 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 an impediment, but uh, it's different than gas where you're completely reliant on public infrastructure for gasoline and diesel. Sure. Uh, but for electricity, most people are going to find that they're going to charge at home or at work. A lot of employers now are, are installing charging for their employees. Um, and and the, the least um, frequent place that they're going to end up charging is out in the public. But they still have to learn how to do it. Right. Yeah. A lot of customers don't see it that way because they're, they are so used to, like you said, refilling, you know, and using public uh, infrastructure to do that. So the fear is always, well, do I have enough range or do I have enough, or does it charge fast enough to get me home or to do whatever? But most people don't realize you're going to be doing all of the charging at home anyway, you know, at least the, the vast majority of it. So yeah, I guess you're, you're, you're right. That's, it's not as big of a concern as most customers, um, might think. And, and every time I discuss electric cars with anyone outside of like the industry, that's their first question is, well, how far can I go? Well, how, what happens if I uh, get to recharge? And I, I feel like most people don't realize that, that every morning you're going to get in your car and it's going to have a full tank, so to speak, you know? Yeah. So that's an inter- That's a good point that you, that you bring up that I feel like most people don't uh, recognize. We like to say with an electric car, imagine it's kind of like this. Imagine if your gas car, while you're sleeping, woke itself up and drove itself to a gas mm-hmm. station. And then just topped itself off and then came back in. Right. Because every morning when you leave, you, you're at 100% charged or, or full, full tank. Right. You know, and uh, you've got the full range of the vehicle. So, you know, what I like to tell people when they're thinking like, well, you know, if, if there's somebody that's maybe interested in an i4 or an iX coming out, you know, their first electric car. And they say, you know, I just don't know if I can adapt to it. I don't know if, if, I have, if it's going to have enough range. So what I tell people is get a little book. And keep it in your car. And every day, reset your trip. Uh, right. And then at the end of the day, just write down, you know, 52 miles. And then tomorrow, do it and reset the trip 71 miles. And then do it. To, and then do that for a month or two. And then see how many days you drove longer or further than what the I-4 or IX's range is going to be. Right. And that'll give you a good idea of how often you might have to seek public charging. Right. That's a, that's a good exercise to do for anyone who is interested but wary of electric cars. Um, I'm glad you brought up the i4 and the iX because being um, someone that really started, you know, with BMW's electric, you know, kind of they're, they're foray into ele- electrification, where do you think it's going now? How do you see the i4 and the iX? Do you, are you optimistic about those cars? Do you think that maybe they should be, BMW should be doing more with them? How do you feel about those? So, you know, um, on paper, they look pretty good. Uh, I, I need to drive one. I need to touch it and feel it. Um, right. I'm going to get an opportunity to do that. I just got my invite um, to go over to Munich in uh, a month or so nice. and uh, drive them and check them out. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, I really need to get behind the wheel. I need to drive them. I need to see how they charge. You know, it's, it's, it's like any car, you know, you really, it's hard to say, oh yeah, these are going to compete well against Audi and Tesla. It's hard to say that in, until you drive it and feel it, you know, yeah. but, uh, they both look like pretty good vehicles to me. The only thing that I will say is I'm a little disappointed that it's, uh, these are 2022 models. Uh, you know, the, yeah. I, the, I, the, Three came out in the end of 2013. It took BMW nine years yeah. to bring out their next all electric car. And in that period, we've seen Tesla take a good chunk of their market share. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 happened. You know, it's it's undeniable. I mean, what one of the, the surveys have been done? I, th- I think the number one car that people have transitioned from to a Tesla was a three series BMW. Yeah. You're right. So so I mean. You know what? What guys? What took you so long? You had a lead. You were out there in 2013. BMW was on the cutting edge of electric. They really were yeah. with BMW i. Their, their, that program. I mean, they they they, they were they were 
you know, the market leaders. Right. And they pulled back. And I, I guess they got a little burned by the, the amount of money that they poured into the I3 and I8. But they did some wild stuff with that. I mean, who was building a, a car made of carbon fiber? Right. You know, I mean, uh, and, and that's what a lot of the stuff they learned from that is still, you know, cascading across their product lines. You know, they're still using, you know, CFRP, body panels and so forth. Yeah. I mean, they learned what they could do. They learned what they couldn't do. So, you know, it's, it's you know, it, it was like a giant science experiment, the I3 and the I8. Yeah. And, and the I8. But um, it's, it's, that's the only thing that's a little, it's a little disappointing for me being a BMW fan, being in their electric vehicle program from, from the start, from 2009, to say, wow, like if you would have told me in 2013 that it was going to be nine years before BMW brought out their next all-electric car, I, w I, I wouldn't have believed yeah. you. There, I mean, there, yeah, you're right. There was a ton of optimism surrounding uh, the iProgram back then because it was so new and innovative. And they were the first to like come out with a subdivision of their own company mm -hmm. all for electric. And it did seem very promising. And then, yeah, the big nine-year uh, drought of you know electrification. And what's odd is that you're right, Tesla took a I mean, they are the market share, right? I mean, they're like the Kleenex of electric cars. That's what people associate with electric cars. It's like the only brand they know. But at the same time, BMW is also losing ground to companies like, like let's say, Volkswagen and Audi. I mean, Audi just put out, what, five or six electric cars in the past three years. So, you know, BMW, I feel like, needs to catch up. But I do, I, I think the iX and the i4 seem like they should be pretty promising. Um, I don't know how you feel about their designs or anything because I know that's a bit of a polarizing topic. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not going to you know go off on the on the huge front grill. You know, I know a lot of people have talked about that. I'm not a big fan of it, but it's also not a deal breaker for me. It's right. not you know I, I wouldn't say oh that's it I'll just rule that out. Do I like that design language? No, but quite honestly, I don't. But um, it, it's. I can look past right. it. You know, I know some people say, you know, really harp on it. I can look past that. Uh, I, I think the, the, the I mean, they think the interior, interior on those vehicles looks really nice. The IX um, you know, uh, the IX in particular seems mm -hmm. gorgeous yeah. on the inside, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to see how they drive. You know, we, we, we want to see what the dri driving dynamics are like. Is it a BMW? You know, does it, um, you know, does it feel like a BMW? You know, one of the things that, when I was on the first press drive with the Porsche Taycan Turbo S, my biggest question going into that was, is this a Porsche? You know, or is this just an electric car with a Porsche badge on right. it? And uh, luckily, it was a Porsche. I mean, that I've driven most of the Porsches made in the last, you know, the, you know decade or so. And uh, that's a Porsche. It, it might be the best Porsche I've ever driven. And, yeah. uh, and I'm not alone on that. When we did the press drive... There were guys from Road and Track, Motor Trend, Car and Driver that when we sat out at dinner at night, they looked at each other and said, that might be the best Porsche I've ever driven too. So it wasn't just me. <laughs> That's pretty um, good. You know, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, uh, big, big words. Yeah. So I'm looking, to, I'm looking to feel that with the I, with the I4 and the IX. I want to get blown away. And, and hopefully when I get the opportunity to drive it, I will. Yeah. I mean, Horatio's driven the I4 prototype of the I4 M50 mm -hmm. and he has incredible things to say about it. I mean, he raved about it. And, you know, so I'm very excited to drive that. Uh, I only had the opportunity to sit in the iX and kind of, like, poke around and play with it. Uh, and it, its interior is wonderful. It's probably the best BMW interior I've ever been in, actually. It's really fantastic. Um, so, yeah, like you, I'm really excited to drive it and to see, you know, if that's a, a worthy next step. And if it's uh, worthy of a nine-year gap, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm wondering if maybe it should have been a few years ago that these cars came out. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen the i4 in like 2018. Right. You know, five years after the i3 came out. You know, I mean, that's plenty of time, you know, and, and it would have went right up dead head to head with, with Tesla. And uh, it would have been interesting to see, you know, how how how, how that panned out over the last few years. But, right. I mean, now we're getting it now, so that's still... Better late than never, now, but I'm um, ask, you're, you, know, you know, hopefully uh, it's, it delivers. Expert, and I ask this to any everyone who uh, deals with electric cars or designers or anything, and it's a question I, I, I'm fascinated by because it seems that there are two trains of thought um, with automakers right now when it comes, well, legacy automakers when it comes to developing electric cars. Do you go with the ultra futuristic style, like how the i3 was like this revolutionary futuristic looking feeling car? 
Or do you kind of go with a more traditional car like the Volkswagen ID4, which kind of just looks like a Volkswagen and feels like a Volkswagen? Where do you think is going to draw the customer base? Uh, like, where do you, which direction do you think is going to be wiser? Let's say. So I think there's room for both, but that said, I think it's it's probably a better uh, strategy right. to just make your car electric. You know, make the right. electric BMW look like a regular BMW. You know, I, 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 but I think there's also room for 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 wild design and and uh, you know cutting edge looks as you get with right. conventionally fueled vehicles every now and then also. You know, um, but. Um, I think it's better to really stick with what the brand, what people are familiar with. But look, you, you buy a BMW, why? For for the performance, the driving dynamics, dynamics, and BMW style. That shouldn't be different right. if you get one that has a different refueling process. You know, everything else should be the same, uh, in my opinion. So you know, uh, in that in that regard, um, you know, uh, I, I I think it should be relatively same. But in the same breath. I, I don't criticize them for what they did with the i3 uh, because that was really that was super early on and um, right. they wanted to create like a new category of BMW. They weren't selling anything like that, like a, this right. you know tiny um, little hatchback, you know what I mean? So it, it, I, I, I understand what they were doing at that point, but if if they would have made an all electric one series or yeah, two probably, series, probably right. I, I think like it would have sold better than the i3. And the lack of range sort of were the two uh, you know, biggest nails in the i3's coffin because, I mean, at the time, the, I think even the Nissan Leaf had more range than the i3, right? When it first came out, like, it wasn't great. Uh, it, it was really close. Um, uh, it might it might um, have, because when the lower. Nissan Leaf first came out, it had only, like, 78 miles of range. But then I think I think two or three mo- years oh, later, when the i3 came out, three, I think it up to 84. Right, right. So yeah, I think three, I think it had car. three more miles of range. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and that's and that, that's telling. You know, when you say you know this is BMW, you know, and uh, premium, it's a premium brand, and with electric right. vehicles, premium is range, it's performance also. So you know, they, they, they in my opinion, that. That that's the i three should have launched with a hundred miles of range. BMW could have done it. The the technology was available. The battery cells were right. available, um, and that 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 was a little bit of a disappointment. So, obviously, Tesla seems to be the sort of king of the electric car um, at the moment. Do you see another brand that's really sort of starting to maybe gain a larger foothold in the electric world, or maybe really starting to push the envelope as well? Maybe challenge Tesla. Uh, is it BMW? Is it another brand, or is there none? Is Tesla just the the king? Well, you know they are the king now. Let's face it. I mean, the the Model Three, it's the number one selling, I think, sedan in that category. Yeah, gas I or or so. electric I, worldwide. I, I don't know exactly. So I, I mean, think, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean that that's that's insane when you think yeah. about that. That it's an electric car and it's the number one selling vehicle in that category. So yeah, they, they're out there. They've they've got a a, a big lead, but. That said, yeah, um, the, the there's companies that are coming out like Lucid right now is coming yeah. out with a really mm-hmm. great high performance long range luxury yeah. sports sedan. It's it's much more luxurious than than any of the Tesla vehicles, um, and it's a it has cutting edge technology. It, it it's it's even more efficient than Tesla. Yeah. It'll be like the first vehicle that's come out that actually is more efficient than a Tesla. Um, a crazy fast, it's got a, a, a thousand eighty yeah, horsepower. The, the, what's it? The Dream Edition, right? The the Lucid Air Dream. The, the, yeah. the Dream Edition, yeah, has a thousand eighty, and they're also making a sport version. Oh, really? It's, it's a tri motor version. It has three motors. It has thirteen hundred oh, right. horsepower. That's the one that ran nine nine quarter yeah. mile, right? Like it's cr- no a nine two four quarter mile. Yeah, <laughs> and this is a a luxury sedan. Running nine twos in a quarter mile, <laughs> so I mean, this, isn't isn't it insane, Nico? So, um, so yeah, L- uh, Lucid's one of the brands. Um, I think I'm going to get a chance to do a factory tour with them in a couple of weeks. Um, and um, then you've got the pickup trucks. You've got Rivian. You know, we here in America, people love pickup trucks. We we buy about three million pickup trucks a year here in the U.S. The F-150 and, um, is the best-selling car in the country. Absolutely. And, but, 
uh, uh, so I forget how many. The, something like four of the top ten selling cars in the U.S. are pickup trucks. Right. So, yeah. like, it's, it's crazy. It is, um, yeah. And uh, so Rivian is is coming. That's launching soon. In Within a month or so, they're going to start customer deliveries. Um, they, oh, I didn't realize it was that soon. Yeah. And, and they're also making all the Amazon, the electric Amazon trucks. They got a contract oh, to make really? 10,000 uh, electric Amazon trucks. So Amazon's wow. going all electric for their fleet. Um, so they're, they're another one. And then it'd be interesting to look um, over into, into China um, when you have companies like Xpeng and Neo, uh, both of which I've flown over to China and had the opportunity to drive their vehicles. These are good cars. You think about Chinese cars and you think it's probably poor quality. You know, you could never put a Chinese car up against a BMW crafted car. Nico, I'm telling you, these new, these latest generation of cars that they're making now are good. They're really? quality. They're solid. They the fit and finish is outstanding. Um, uh, and you know, I mean, they, they got smart in China. They they started hiring all engineers and production managers from BMW, Volkswagen, Toyota. You know, all, from all right. these companies, and they brought them over there to teach them really how to put together cars properly and. Uh, these latest generation of cars, let me tell you, uh, they're, you know, by the middle of this decade, these are going to be global brands. Neo is going to be available yeah. in Germany, in the U.S. Xpeng is going to be available globally. And, and it's going to ha- what's going to happen is like what happened with the Japanese cars in the early 70s. They came over and people kind of look, put their, look, look down their nose on them. They were little, right. little toys, right? What right. happened 10 years later? You know, to, they, they right. were everywhere. And, uh, I think we're going to see that with the, with these Chinese cars, the, the Chinese, the electric Chinese cars, and uh, that's something to keep an eye on. That is interesting. Uh, you know, you don't typically think about uh, the Chinese market uh, in terms of manufacturing. You know, they're the largest car market in the world, but you don't really uh, think of it in terms of manufacturing. But yeah, I mean, I haven't he- heard much of the Xpeng, but Neo I've heard of, mm-hmm. and I've seen some of their cars, and they look pretty cool. So you know, I think that that should be interesting. And they're quality um, built. I'm telling you, I've yeah. I've driven them. They're they're, you know, that, that's encouraging. Fit and finish, to fit yeah. and finish on them was is better than most Tesla cars. You know, which <laughs> as we all know, the yeah, Tesla strong the suit is not their fit and finish. No, it is you not. Know, they, no. They're great on user interface. They're great on efficiency. They're great on battery technology, but they're not the best at building cars. Right, right. <laughs> but you know, yeah. that's listen. You, you can't have everything. Right. Um, so I want to actually ask you about another interesting topic, just si- kind of silly, because um, <laughs> you mentioned Tesla and their user interface. How do you feel about the new yoke, the steering yoke in the Tesla Model S? So I dr- the one car I drove that had a steering yoke was the Concept Mercedes EQS. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that car. It's their yes. new like flagship yes. electric car. So do you remember they had that concept out for a while that made the rounds? I remember Um, it looked incredible, but I don't remember the interior. Oh, the interior looked incredible also, but it had a yoke. And I had the opportunity to drive it on a a closed airstrip. Um, Mercedes invited me out to California and they rented out this airstrip. And we were able to drive it up and down the airstrip. And it just felt wrong. Like when I was turning... I, I was like hand over hand. Then I had to let go and grab this here. And it, it, right. I, I, could, would I get used to it? I suppose I would, um, but it just felt wrong. And uh, hmm. I haven't, I, I haven't had the opportunity to drive the Model S yet. Uh, ha, have you watched some of the videos? It kind of looks awkward. I have. It like, looks very difficult. And, doesn't it? So, yeah. and but the then you've got the then you've, you've got the owner it. saying it's great. I love it. But you know oh, what? Yeah. I mean, so many Tesla owners, like BMW owners, listen, right, yeah. you know, we're, 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 we're all cut from the same cloth. Um, you know, well, the, Tesla could do no wrong. You know, right. I mean, they could, you know, they could give them a stick for a steering wheel right. and, and then right. say, Elon's a genius. <laughs> it's a yeah. stick steering wheel. You know? <laughs> Tesla certainly does not have the monopoly on fanboys, but they yeah. might be the loudest of them. So Currently. Uh, currently. Yeah, currently. But BMW you know, has its fair share. Right? Oh, from, yeah. I've oh, heard yeah. from them several times. Uh, I know. Um, so have I. Yeah. But uh, I just, I, I, that was an interesting thing. I keep seeing videos of it. And 
They didn't change. They didn't shorten the steering ratio. No, so like, it's a lot of turns lock to lock that you got to really it's weird. shuffle. You that got to let around. go of the wheel and grab yeah. the wheel. Like I don't know. You know, I'm. I'm you know, there's going to be an accident, and you know the person's going to say the yoke messed me up. You know, I mean, right. we sue over everything here in the U.S. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> You know, right. so you know somebody's going to sue Tesla over it somehow. Their hand's going to get caught in the middle of it. And it's going to twist it or something. Right. But, um, you know, we'll see. Uh, you know, hopefully nobody gets hurt. Um, I, I haven't driven it yet, so I can't really comment on it. I've driven a car with a yoke. I didn't like it. Um, but this could be a different driving experience. I'm hoping once uh, a friend of mine get takes delivery, I can get one so I could do a, a proper uh, range test on it and driving review and all that stuff. Right. Um, so one last question, because I know you got you have uh, you have to you have somewhere else to be. Um, the future of BMW's electrification. Are you optimistic about it? Do you think that they are headed in the right direction, even though it did take too long? Uh, how do you feel about where BMW's headed? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I like BMW as a brand. I've I've I I, I like their cars. I've owned them. Uh, I I think that. They understand the market well, where it's at. I I also understand why they they didn't go all in. You know, seven, six, seven years ago, maybe the market wasn't ready for that yet. Um, but I just wish they had gotten gone a little bit further than what they did. So I'm not concerned with 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 with, with BMW right now. Um, I really want to see how these two cars drive. Um, now remember, the i4 isn't a dedicated platform that was built just for electrification. So I'm curious to see how that works. The iX does have a dedicated platform. Yeah. Most of the best driving electric vehicles have dedicated platforms. So, you know, I know BMW was on the dedicated platform, uh, you know, train when they made the i3 and the i8. And then they got off it and said, no, we're going to use this flexible architecture. But now they said, no, nope, you know what? We realize we got to do dedicated platforms, right? The next generation is going to... so. Um, that I'm, I'm happy to hear that they're back on that. If they were still going to say, look, we're going to make all our cars with this flexible architecture so we could use ICE, we could use plug-in hybrid, we could use electrification, um, a fully electric, I'd be, I'd be a lot more concerned about it because quite honestly, in my opinion, when you do that, it compromises all the cars. None right. of them are fully maximized to the potential they could be. It's not the best electric car it could be. It's not the best ICE car it could be. You, there's compromises made. Right. But now that I hear that they're going to go back to that dedicated platform, the next the next platform that's coming out, I feel like, okay, that you know they had a plan. Um, they, they maybe thought that they were went to the market too early, so they pulled back a little bit, and now they're going to show us what they could do. If that's the case, great. Show us what you can do. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, I will let you go. I know you have somewhere to be, but thank you so much for uh, talking to me today. Uh, tons of great insight on electric cars. And just one more quick thing, because you actually showed it before. Can you show that water bottle you have just to prove that you did all three? Uh... Sure. So, yeah, when I got my i3, BMW made this really cool water bottle that they gave to all the people that were in the whole program from the beginning. You can see the BMW logo. Then here, Born Electric. And it, it shows that that's the Mini E. And they said that I was a pioneer. And that, that was the I, the uh, Active E. And then I was an Electronaut. And then when I got the i3, I was a Visionary. So it was a cool um, swell water bottle that um, uh, BMW uh, gave to the people that were in the program from the beginning. You know, they, they made these up for the people that had bit, had walked this journey with them from the, the, the Mini E all the way up to the, uh, the i3. Definitely. I'm, I'm glad to be on. Thanks for having me. I just want to mention, if anybody wants to check out my YouTube channel, it's called State of Charge with Tom Malogany. I have a bunch of videos on electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging. I do charging station reviews, all electric stuff. So hope to see you there.